So I'm going to go over a story of what we, what we encountered, how we came up with a, a way to do the fingerprinting that, we talked, that we're going to talk about, and why it was necessary, and then how, did we, how do we look to apply that in some of the things that we do. So I'm Jeff. John had to go. He had a family emergency. Um, so he'll be back. Or we, you can have his contact information at the end also. So for myself, I've been working with Bro for a little while. Um, the first version I used was .07, and I was in the basement of a building, very large building across the road, and uh, the guy that introduced me to Bro is actually here, and a big shout out to Larry Levinson for getting me started with Bro. So let's start and go through what, we, what we're going to talk about for fingerprinting encrypted channels with Bro for high fidelity detections. Okay, that means a lot. Here we go. So we got to set the groundwork. SSL. So really how SSL works, John put together a network diagram for us. It's very detailed. It gives us everything we need to know. <clears throat> we've got a client on the left, we've got a server on the right, and then you've got a TAP or network intrusion detection system or something in the middle. So to see SSL, it's got to be established. So we have this, the TCP three-way handshake, SYN, SYN ACK, ACK. And then we have the client hello, the server says hello back, and then we get the X509, and then the uh, server replies, and then we go from there. And that establishes our SSL connection. So when we first started looking at this, it was very easy to use Bro to pull out all of the information about the X509 certificate. It was great. It was one of the visibilities that I didn't have with some of the other tools. And in the pyramid of pain, as you can see, we work our way up the stack, making it harder for the adversaries to change what they're doing and make it harder for them to evade our detections. So the X509 was great. And we started using Metasploit as an example where we start doing analysis, seeing how we can apply Bro, what does it look like. And here is an example of the X509 log from Bro for the SSL certificate, uh, it, it was a while ago. The big things to note, and I don't know if you can see in the back or not, it's really just a bunch of garbly gunk in the O and L fields. And the reason for that, because Metasploit is open sourced, is because of the way they coded it up. Here you can see that in the L field and the O field, it's just a bunch of random characters, and there's 10, the 20 of them. And then, so this is what we, we have, and the big thing is, how do we detect that? It looks pretty simple. All of these can be used. You can find a regex to look for uh, you know, the number of characters and see if it's upper and lowercase and mixed. And then John said, well, the L field should really be a city. And if I just look for anything that starts with A to Z or Z to A, and there's, you know, this uses this pattern in it, then this should never happen. He said that Washington, D.C. was probably the closest one that may have that pattern in it. So here's the bro script that he put together. And the big things to notice is we establish the pattern up at the top where it says local Metasploit. And then down at the below, in, in the blue in the bottom, we look at the C field, which is the country code. And then if the pattern is in the L field, the old fi L field, then we know that there's something there. And it was really funny to, to see how John was handling it well, how he was dealing with Metasploit at a different place than I was back at the time <clears throat> and, and see how the changes affected us. So John said, um, all right, so he, John took this out and he says, hey, here's a great way to do a detection. Took it to Nova Hackers uh, locally here. And the next week, this guy did a commit to the GitHub. Uh, this guy, HDM, so we're going to change it. We're going to change the X509, try and make it more like the snake oil certificate and see if we can make it blend in a little bit better. So, you know, it was great. And uh, John was determined to find a way to, to keep the detection going. So what happened here? <clears throat> so they changed a few things in, in the actual code itself. And the C... The CN is the part that got changed, and it really looks a lot more like the certificate. Sorry, the uh, snake oil certificate. We'll find the right one here. 
There we go. This is what I was looking for. So up above, you can see that he matched it really well. <clears throat> it was pretty static. It looked like the snake oil. Uh, he changed the, the certificate start and end times, so try and randomize it a little bit. Um, but one thing that stood out, HDM said, you know what, we're going to be very secure. We're going to use SHA-256. The snake oil usually just used SHA-1. So that was something that was very obvious for us. And then the CN itself had a random lowercase field or value that just got shoved in there. So that one kind of stood out. So here is the bro script that was being used and it worked out really great. So wouldn't you know it, after you know that you'd stalked about, another change happens. Our Rick Whitcroft went through and said, okay, we want to make it a little bit more blend in better, make it more look more like cities and codes. So as you can see down at the bottom, you can see how he's actually put some thought and randomness into what does it look like and you can see there's actually names in the CN. Here's an example of some of the certificates. And John was like, well, here's the pattern we can use to do detection for these things. It should work out okay. And then there was a commit shortly afterwards, and then this particular commit broke it. And the, the certificate subject and issuer just had the field down at the bottom, C equals forward slash, C equals US forward slash, ST equals star, and at that point it just broke. So have another pattern to be able to, to detect that, and the problem is things keep changing. So what do we do next? So here we go. Let's move. Let's move up the chain. Let's get away from network-based artifacts if possible. Let's try and extrapolate some information about what is actually generating the traffic. And the best thing we could come up with was, um, you know, we had to go do some research. And Josh, Josh Atkins gave us the idea of, hey, let's see what we can do about coming up with a fingerprint for it on this hello packet. And we looked around and this is the first instance that, that we really noticed at the beginning was this guy Ivan was looking at web bots that were coming across and Googlebot had four ciphers that it supported and it was still stood out so it was easy to identify which sparked the idea. And then another thing we saw was Lee Brotherston came up with fingerprint TLS and it went through a more methodical approach and really detailed out how to build a fingerprint and we're like this is spectacular. But we don't run Python as our sensor, so we can't do that. So some of the requirements are it needed to work on our tools, and that's why we're here. It's, uh, we need to fingerprint the client and as much as we can. What makes the client unique on the network? Easy to create. One of the big things of why the tool looks like it does is we want to be able to share it out. And we knew that a lot of analysts knew what MD5s look like, and we figured if we can shove these things into threat intelligence platforms, we'll be able to get the information out to others and be able to share very quickly. And then easy to consume by any tool. So here's an example of two client hellos of different, different um, clients. And the one on the left has 13 cipher suites with 124 extensions. The one on the right has 19 cipher suites with 141 cipher suites, or sorry, with 141 extensions. So right there, there's a lot of deviation, a lot of difference. So here is Microsoft Edge browser. 19 cipher suites, 107 extensions. The Drydex malware, 21 cipher suites, so it supports more ciphers, but only 41 extensions. That's almost a third of what the, the Microsoft browser had which for us is really good. It's easier to identify. Here's TrickBot, uh, 12 cipher suites, so not very many, and on only 21 extensions per unique. The, okay, so the next thing we're looking at is the cipher suites themselves. <clears throat> What's the, what makes them unique and how do, we, how do we extrapolate that out to something that makes sense to us? 
So here we have the Cypher Suites and the Microsoft Edge browser, and it goes from the strongest and works its way down to the least uh, strongest encryption, which, which makes sense. You want the, the server to come back and say, I want to speak as you know, a specific strength of encryption, and this, the browser says, I support all these. You pick one, I don't care. The next one, TrickBot. Cypher suites are all over the place. So it goes from stronger to weaker, weaker to stronger, stronger to weaker. And there's, I don't understand why it's built like that, but that remains to be seen. We'll have to see what we can find out. So here are two of the, here are two clients, and we're gonna look at the parts that make up the JAW3 fingerprint that, that we're looking at here. So we look at the first one on the top, we're just gonna work our way down the arrows, is the, the TLS version. So here they're both version 1.2. The Cypher Suites, on the left we have 13, on the right we have 19. The Extensions, on the left we have 124, on the right we have 141. And then the elliptical curve, the elliptic curves, and then the elliptic curve point formats are also included. So let's take a look at what it looks like as the bro script starts building these out. It adds the, the version itself, and we decided not to do any of the conversions from what is in the packet just because we don't want to have to do the lookups to be able to put the, uh, the other strings in. And then the ciphers in the order that they come, so in, in Microsoft browser, they were just all straight order, um, strongest to weakest. And in TrickBot, we kept them in the same order and it would go up and down. And then we have the extensions that are included. We have the elliptic curves and the elliptic curve point formats. And then we have the MD5 hash for it. Something that is condensed, analysts know what it means, uh, it's easy to look up, and we can use it very efficiently. So if there's fields that don't have a value, for example, here we have the elliptic points uh, formats and the elliptic curves not populated, there's still these left blank with a comma, and it still produces a unique MD5. So there we go. There's the magic. Nice and easy. So here's a Google Chrome, Microsoft Edge. Here's a Tor client. Drydex malware, TrickBot. Now, the big question is, what about TLS 1.3? What we did is we looked at two clients, their hello packets, and we said, okay, how much can we see? Will it make it unique if we apply this logic to it? Up at the very top, we have the Cypher Suites. On the left is 17, on the right is 18. So there's a difference there. Uh, down below, we're going to see the session ticket TLS, which uh, identifies that it's version 1.3 in a different order uh, of the headers than the others. So we'll be able to see the elliptic, point, uh, the elliptic curves and the elliptic curve point formats and the session ticket in different orders, and it gives us a unique value. So it seemed to work out really well. So this is, this is where the magic is. If the client hello goes across, even if it's just a, a box sitting there on the internet, it, it accepts TCP three-way handshake and then it doesn't respond at all, we still captured that fingerprint so we can identify the client the best we can. So there we go. JAW3 is starting to look at the tooling. It works pretty good. Here's the information on how to get it. It was created by John Althaus, myself, and Josh Atkins. Uh, Lee Brotherston has the fingerprint TLS, and we took that and ran with it in 2015. He gave a DerbyCon talk and said, hey, here's an idea. Run with it and see what you guys come up with. So we did. All right. So let's talk about the, once you have JAW3, you want to understand what those hashes are. So we took all the JAW3s that we had, and we took a lot of our host-based logging, we combined them, and we will come up with a mapping of hash to application. It's not an easy thing to do, and um, it does take a lot of time, and there's, we're looking into some other tools that we can do to make it easier and more effective. So Trusul came through, and he took Lee Brotherston's uh, TLS fingerprints, converted it into something that they could use, um, and so the, the mapping here <clears throat> is an example of what it looks like. Here's all the logs from John's laptop. So this was his laptop for a day. And as you can see, most of what he does 
is browsing the internet. <laughs> I don't know what he's doing on here, but he's browsing the internet. It looks like he might have some, uh, he might be listening to some music with, with Spotify or iTunes. And, um, but it gives us an idea of what this host is, is doing. So in a larger network type of environment, you're able to take a look at the traffic and say, out of you know, the hundreds of gigabytes a second, what does our traffic look like? What is the profile of it? Here we can see that most of this is going to be web browsing. Over almost 40% is Chrome. So we have a heavy Chrome user. Uh, there's some people using Firefox. It looks like there's some developers using Eclipse. Um, so it gives you an idea of what the overall makeup and interests of the people or the tools that they're using on your network are. So John's a, a big Steam guy, and he, he picks this one out. So he can say, you know, he's looking at who's playing Steam on the network, and you can see that it's OSS, OS Xbox or um, another guy with Firefox. So at least we have someone that is a diehard Firefox guy. <coughs> so let's take it the next step. Once we, you know, if you've got your host base logging and you've got the JAW 3s, you can combine those. What is it that, how do you use that to make information, to give yourself a better idea of what's going on, and how do you apply that to malware and sandboxes? And the big thing is you need to be able to baseline your sandboxes. This uh, G. Bradford has a tool. There's several tools out there for, for doing this type of thing, for testing SSL connections. But this specific one will go through, and it says, OK, I'm going to make a, an SSL connection, and I'm going to use different types of of Windows APIs for this one specifically. And we're going to do it using a domain name and not using a domain name because that makes, you know, every, every tool can have two, at least two JAW 3s because of that. Um, if you don't include the domain name, then there's no SNI, uh, no server name there. So here's an example of Windows, two, uh, Windows 10 and Windows 2016. Now, the big thing that is, Interesting is how do you get this information to the analyst and how do you make an impactful, how do you make it worth their time to be, to use it? Here's an example from Reservoir Labs. Um, we basically looked at how do long, uh, how, do you, how do file exfiltration look on the network? And with uh, the help of uh, Bob Rofset from Reservoir Labs, we, were, we have a tool to be able to do this. John is great at working on his graphs, so we're going to look at what outbound traffic looks like for a host. <laughs> and I, I assume this is the host that he was using earlier. Um, so it's all over the place, right? Now, a file transfer, when you transfer a file out, it's going to peak out at a certain threshold, and it's going to go for a certain amount of time, and then when the file is done being transferred, it's going to drop back off. So the, the logic is, as bytes per second increase, if it crosses a threshold, start watching it. And then as it crosses time, it hits another threshold. So we know we're transferring a certain amount of bandwidth or for a certain amount of time. We say that's when we start tracking this connection. And then when the bytes per seconds drop, log it out, and we know we, we have a file transfer. It works pretty well. And this is what the analyst will get. So they have this example of Dropbox. Somebody uploaded something to Dropbox, pretty simple. Now, take the information that we have for our mapping of JAW 3 to clients, and we go to the analyst and we say, OK, analyst, this is a Dropbox client going out to a server with a Dropbox certificate. That makes sense. That looks right. Let's, let's you know, devil's advocate, what happens if it looks like that? How many times have you seen PowerShell try and transfer something out to Dropbox? I haven't seen it yet. So that's something that the analysts will handle very differently. You know, they're going to have run books. If it's a Dropbox client and it's going out to Dropbox, let it go. If it's not, dig into it and open an incident, something like that. Another here is hunting weird certificates. So in certificate subjects, DGA specifically, they, they pop up and a lot of people have generated a lot of time creating or reversing DGA algorithms and then generating as many 
of these domains that they can, so they can put them into their, their platforms to be able to match the, the domain names and see when traffic hits. Here specifically, let's take a look at these. They're kind of long, they're ugly by DGA. When we pivot on one of them, we'll see that the jaw three is particular one here. Uh, doesn't mean much to me right now, but if you take a look at pivoting on that jaw three to see what happens, here we have that client, that type of client, going out to a whole list of domains that are generated by the DGA, and some of them are doing TLS or SSL over 9001. So that's a, a way that you can pivot on jaw threes to get uh, a better idea of what the impact is to your environment. How many servers out on the internet does this type of client reach out to? Or better yet, how many of your clients inside your network have this application on it? Now, one of the tools that uh, came up recently that we, I decided to play with was Evil Gen X. And basically, it was designed to be a phishing proxy that would perform man in the middle and bypass two-factor authentication. Beautiful work. I'm glad they open sourced it because it scares the crap out of me. <clears throat> so we took a look at it. Uh, we set it up, and basically you go through the steps, and it generates a link. You take this link, you send it to your best friend, and you say, hey, click on me. And then they'll log in to their, to their LinkedIn or what else we got here? LinkedIn, Facebook, Outlook, Reddit, Twitter, mobile, Twitter. All of these things are built in to the tool. And you can create custom fishlets for it. So anyways, you can see that it logged the, the email address and the password. And since it's not my real account, I didn't put in my token. It worked. So we, we went through the process of setting it all up, taking a look at the traffic, capturing the, the PCAP, running it across Bro, generating a JAW3. And this is what we found out. Uh, it was written in Go. Uh, we know that because of the blog article and things like that and what it was designed for. But we put it on our network. And we went from having, you know, let's say we have 1,000 connections. We say, OK, show me how many look like a Go client that matches this JAW3. And it narrows it down an order of magnitude, hopefully. You know, hopefully, most browsers are going to be Chrome, Firefox, Microsoft, um, and not a Go client. So it's a way to pivot and, and, and partition your data set so you can narrow down what you're looking at. It doesn't tell you exactly what's going on. So some of the things you can do is look at the server side and say, OK, is this a, if this is a Go client based on our JAW3, but the HTTP headers say that it is actually Firefox or Chrome, there's a mismatch there. There's something that doesn't seem quite right. And of course, they can put anything they want into the uh, HTTP headers because they wrote the client. Um, another tool. I guess you can say we like playing with the tools and see what it looks like. And, and this particular one, Puppy Rat, it's another open source one. It was used by, by the Iranians. And um, there's a lot of domains. So instead of going through and throwing a bunch of domains into your, into your Splunk or whatever sim you're using, um, we said, OK, what, what is it going to look like? So in the open source um, repositories, we looked at the ciphers. And there's a very short number of ciphers, which is great for us because we know that the tool is going to be able to handle that, and it'll be it'll differentiate itself from other clients. So for this particular one, this client, uh, that's a JAW three four. Here's all the ciphers that it supported, and as you know, notice there's one in there um, that is unknown. And we didn't go through the time to see which one's stronger or weaker than the others, because it takes a while unless you write Python really quickly. So we didn't worry about that. <clears throat> so it worked really well because there was anomalies in the way that it was built. Here's an, another example of that. Uh, we had pen testers that were looking at, they had created a custom, piece, uh, custom tool, piece of malware, that was specially for us. The beautiful thing was they only supported one cipher. So the JAW3 looked like this, and it stand out pretty easily. It was easy to, to identify. Now John's favorite, favorite tool of choice, Metasploit, he, 
we were looking at that, and if, if anybody here doesn't know, Moloch is a full packet capture tool. It's great. Uh, it does wonders on being able to, to capture packets and parse it out and be able to uh, retrieve certain sections of it. Here's an example of it here. You can molo the CH. Um, but here, we want to look at the JAW3. Here's the JAW3 of the Meterpreter HTTPS client. <clears throat> now, this particular line, this is where I got to make sure I do John justice because he's got this backwards and forward. We're looking at how do we better detect um, Interpreter, which uses uh, the Windows API, and the domain JAW3, which is the server side, is down below it. So if you take a look at the JAW3 for just the Interpreter on the network, it's a Windows, it's a Windows API. It could be all over the place, right? So John said, let's take a look at <clears throat> what happens when we take a client and it reaches out to a server. The server is going to respond. How does the server respond? The client says it's going to send out a, 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 a. The, the server says, OK, I want to speak back in A, chooses the ciphers specifically. A different client could give a different set of cipher suites, and then the server <coughs> excuse me, will reply back with the same cipher or a different cipher that it wants to use. So here is an example of what the server hello packet looks like. And here we have the TLS version, the cipher suites that are used, and the extensions. There's 13 extensions that we can use to, to generate a fingerprint. So we do the same thing. That's what it looks like. So now we can not only fingerprint the client as much as we can and apply logic to it to say here's a mapping between the applications coming from the host to what is the server, how does the server respond? And when we looked at this, <clears throat> we have two clients that are making four connections out to this web server and they responded exactly the same each time. That worked out pretty well. So TrickBot malware from some of the uh, traffic we've been able to take a look at and analyze. Here is the pair. We use both of these together. Ice D malware. Here's the Tor. Now, this is included in JAW3S. So if you decide, or sorry, JAW3. So if you decide to do oh, bro packages, by the way, they work out great. If you decide to install the package, it's going to be built into it and you'll be able to have it there. And John said, okay, let us exploit round five. Reverse HTTPS. <coughs> so we're looking at the server hello on a Kali Linux server. So it responded back to the Windows Meterpreter HTTPS client with this specific cipher. And when we put that on our network, we saw one or two hits. And if you remember, there were tons of hits for the, for the client itself. But you combine them. And now you're able to say, we don't see a, a Windows a HTTPS um, client that is reaching out to a Kali Linux server. And we can knock that off the list. And that works out very well. Being able to be a higher fidelity, we know that these, this is what the clients um, and the servers are at, how they're acting, and the analysts are going to be able to respond to it accordingly. Um, let's see, we're going through. Pretty good on time. Cobalt Strike, looking at here with Kali Linux, it's the same thing. Kali Linux, uh, sorry, Cobalt Strike is an interpreter implant and it beacons back out to a Kali Linux. And here's some of the extensions that are a little bit different. And it's the same thing on our network. Combining JAW3, JAW3S, we up the ante. We're able to identify not only the one side, but both sides and how they communicate together. So here's a, here's a fun one. <clears throat> we had a pen tester group that came through and said, OK, we want to look at um, obviously getting into the network. And this is the JAW3 that we have for the piece of malware. And this is, <laughs> this is what it looks like in our Splunk instance. He's, he swore to me that he captured it and, and did a screenshot, but this is as good as we got. 
All right, so it's all over the place. So let's match up Jaw 3 with Jaw 3S for a known empire environment. This is what it looks like. So let me just sneak a peek real quick up front. Okay, <clears throat> so here, this, is, this one is really fun. We frustrated the crud out of the penetration testers because as soon as we were tipped off, uh, we found the traffic, we, we remediated the host, and the pen testers threw their hands up and said, okay, whatever, we're just gonna change our X509 certificate. So they changed their X509 certificate, and guess what happens? They get a shell, we stand back, oh, wait a second, we gotta take that host offline and off again, and pen testers are just like, what's going on? So they went through that, they changed, um, they went from uh, physical boxes to cloud providers, still right off the bat. We got them right away. Moved to a different cloud provider, AWS, the Google Compute, still were able to find them because they used the same image. You know, they took their infrastructure and they moved it all around, but they didn't change the tooling itself. And that is where we're trying to, we're trying to get to, is moving them up the stack. And, you know, that, that <laughs> John was in on one of the, the debriefs and he's like, that's the first time that he ever heard a pen tester said that they were demoralized. Because every time, <laughs> Every time they got a shell, boom, 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 we were knocking them off. It was, it was wonderful. All right, <clears throat> so, so that's Jaw 3 and Jaw 3S. And we wanted to, to bring the light, uh, uh, something else we've been working on. This is doing a fingerprint for SSH clients, and it was a concept by Ben Reardon, who's one of our counterparts down in Australia, and we've had a fun time trying to, to build this out and make it usable. So we looked at what are all of the things that are in clear text that we can parse out thanks to Bro. Again, all of this is, is something that we had on our network, we had capability to dig into with the events that are built into the Bro uh, analyzers. So we just said, oh, we wanna find the, for example here, we wanna find the host key algorithms. There's the event for it, pull it out, we have access to all the data, it was phenomenal. So this is what we looked at, <clears throat> the key algorithms, the encryption algorithms from client to server, the authentication algorithms that were used, and then the compression. Using this combination, we were able to get an idea of what the clients are. So here, specifically, one of the reasons why we chose to include the uh, compression algorithms because they don't always use compression and they can flip them back and forth or use different ones, and it was a good uh, point of entropy to include. So it looks like this, uh, here's a key exchange, we list out all the ciphers that are used, the encryption itself, the message authentication, the compression, do the same thing, MD5 it up, and we have another uh, piece of intel that we can share out and identify clients with. It's a completely separate thing from JAW3, it uses some of the same methodologies that uh, Lee Brotherson used in some of his tools, but it gives us the ability to, to take another client with a different protocol and apply the same type of fingerprinting um, method itself. <clears throat> so it, it gets ugly and we don't log that out. Um, in verbose mode, you can put this out and, and make your eyes bleed if you want to try and read it. There we go. And so this is where it's available. It was recently open sourced. So feel free to grab it, play with it, and, and use it. One of the things that Ben told me was, <clears throat> he said, this is wonderful. I had a SSA scanner come across one of the boxes and it changed the user string. So it said it was, um, you know, it was a putty client or it was whatever it was. It just keep changing it, rolling through different ones. But the hash never changed. So it was very easy to, to watch and uh, share that type of intel across. Um, so that was Ben Reardon and Adele, John Altaus and myself, while well worked on that. And in conclusion, JAW3 is not a silver bullet. Um, collisions can happen. Applications can connect through OS APIs. There can be up to five JAW3s for the same application, just, to, just depending on how the connection is established. For example, the, the SNI with uh, you know, going out to an IP versus a domain name. 
Um, but it's always useful as a point to pivot on. And then it can be a silver bullet, sometimes. If it's, if it's a specific piece of malware and there's something unique about the way that the, the key exchange happens, it'll be very unique and we can see it. Uh, one of the problems is it's different for the environments, and, but if you can combine it with the JAW3S, it gives you the ability to narrow down and identify better things. Um, one of the things that I'm, that I'm hoping to be able to, to share later is um, the, uh, another way of making JAW3 to application mappings a little bit easier. So this style of fingerprint can work across other encrypted channels. Uh, the question is, what are they? How do we get access to them? And then just taking the time to, to dev it out and see what we can find. So take it, do something with it, share it back with us. Let us know if you apply it to a different protocol or if you can say, you know, there's something messed up here, go fix it. We'll be happy to do that. And uh, yeah, this is John's Giphy that he built. So <laughs> it's, it's all up there. Right now it's out in the industry. Uh, there's a lot of tools that are using it and uh, support it, which is really great. And uh, of course, John's not here, but here's our contact information. And feel free to reach out and give us some ideas or criticisms or just say hi. So that's it. All right, questions? randomizing the, uh, the ciphers lists, for instance. So the, the question is, have we seen people randomizing ciphers trying to bypass the fingerprinting, make it harder? The answer is, um, I personally have not seen it, but I've heard of people doing it, and it's a catch-22 because not only when they, when they randomize it are they bypassing your fingerprint, but they're leaving a huge trail. So if it's just randomized, you're going to have one client that has a ton of different hashes to it, and that's going to be an outlier in itself, something you should look at. Have you thought about applying this uh, logic to HTTP headers? <clears throat> um, that work has been done. And it is out in the public domain. Uh, you're going to have to look for it. Uh, it's client header anomaly detection. Um, but it's, it's good stuff. Um, so randomization of the cypher suites was mentioned. But do you see anyone trying to actually copy cypher suites that they know other applications are going to be using to try and basically create a collision and blend in with the noise for something really common like Chrome or something else. I know you have the server-side data as well, which would help mitigate some of that. But just curious, you see anyone that's noticing your work and then <laughs> trying actively to get around it? Um, I've heard that there is, there's been a shift in some more sophisticated actors um, where they will either randomize or try and mimic. And I mean, it just makes sense. Look as much like Chrome as you can. There's, uh, we've got some ideas on how we can trend and provide an infrastructure to try and get insight into when that's happening. Um, just have to get some time to be able to work on it. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Very good.